Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 24th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We explain why the News Miner editorial board is hallucinating about the potential for a gas pipeline. Second, we discuss a subject that we think Alaska's congressional candidates should be discussing a lot more this election cycle. And third, we note another nail in the coffin of Cook Inlet production and ask again why the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, the RCA, isn't pushing the state's South Central Utilities to develop a realistic way forward. And now let's join Michael. You've got the the, the dope here on the news miner and their hallucinations, um, which uh, has something to do with um, the need for an in-state gas line. Oh, we need a Wally Hickel. That's what's going on. I can read the headline. That's all I can read. We need a Wally Hickel. So take it away, my friend. Well, I think the the news miner may have proven yet again why it's had to move to nonprofit status because I don't I don't think it understands I don't I don't think it understands profits. I don't it may not understand well, I don't think it understands the bottom line of basic uh, economics. I mean yeah. basic economics. So the the headline this is an op-ed. This isn't an article. This isn't somebody else. This is an article about something somebody else said. It's a headline. Uh, in the in the op-ed section, written by the by the news miner itself, the news miner editorial staff, which may be one person anymore, um, that says an in-state gas line in need of a Wally Hickel, and the opening paragraph is it's a prospect that is too good not to consider. Maybe just maybe Alaska could finally see an in-state gas line from the North Slope, an energy source that could help lower the cost. Good Lord. Lower costs for rail, be- rail belt communities and the seemingly never-ending quest for affordable heat and power. And it goes on, it lifts off from this recent announcement between AGDC, the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, and Great Bear Pantheon Resources, um, which is a, a, a wannabe producer up on the North Slope, um, about the recent contract that they entered into where Great Bear promised more gas than it has. Um, to supply a pipeline that hasn't been built <laughs> by AGTC um, to, uh, to to transport the non-existent gas, yet non-existent gas, down to uh, d- uh, through the AG, yet non-existent AGTC pipeline down to uh, down to the Cook Inlet, and it would solve in the in the news miners' opinion, it would solve the it'd be the solution for everything. Um, it would solve Fairbanks's problem. It would solve South Central's Cook Inlet problem. It would just solve everything. And all it needs um, is, a, it, according to the news miner, is a visionary in the, mo- in the mode of, of Wally Hickel to, uh, to kick start it and keep kicking it down, down the road. Now, Wally Hickel had a pipeline at one time, the Yukon Pacific uh, gas line that he was going to build from the North Slope down to Valdez. Uh, was a vision was one of the visions that Wally uh, Wally had. Uh, he formed a corporation for it. He entered into partnerships for it. He had a whole you know, series of 
uh, permits that he pursued. He was going to uh, export the gas out of Valdez into uh, into the Far East. He was going to turn it into LNG and export it into the Far East. Never got off the ground. <laughs> so so maybe unintentionally, what the uh, what the what the news miner is is asking for is a visionary that realizes that that it doesn't pencil out even remotely pencil out and kills it uh, sort of like ultimately happened to wally's pipeline wally wasn't the one that killed it the market was nobody would finance it uh but maybe uh maybe maybe the news miner unintentionally is is suggesting that that this go down the same same road what the what the age what the contract between pantheon and agdc is is a it, it's it's more than a hail mary i mean <sighs> It reminds me a lot. There was a company uh, that owned um, what is now owned by John Hendricks's Hex that owned that prospect, um, the Kitchen Lights prospect, long before John Hendricks, a company called Escapita. And Escapita drilled a well out there and found some gas and, said, and announced in a legislative hearing that they found more gas in that field. They were going to find more gas in that field that had been discovered in the Cook Inlet to date, then to date. This was the early 20 teens, maybe. Um, and what they did was extrapolate from the gas they found in this one well and and just and 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 extrapolated it over the entire that that one section that they found was gas prone, extrapolated it over the entire kitchen lights field and said, if this well, didn't even say if that that this gas zone would continue, would be continuous across the entire kitchen lights field would have the same size and and as a result would volumetrically hold this much gas. Uh, and there are huge headlines. I mean, everybody, not everybody, but the papers bought off on it and and had had this field day about solved. You know, we've, we've got this new find. Uh, well, <laughs> it, it understand it, th that that comment understood zero about the Cook Inlet because the Cook Inlet isn't a continuous zone. The Cook Inlet pinches in and has and has breaks and has faults and has all sorts of things going on in it that 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 ensure that finding gas in one well in one area uh, will not continue it will not be continuous throughout the throughout the entire field and it just it turned into a, a joke after a while uh, I mean it was taken seriously at the time I, I remember Mike Chenault you know saying it was a great thing. Um, uh, but it continued, it, it continued seriously for a while. And then it, then it sort of fell apart as people realized what, what they were actually claiming. It's the same thing here. Pantheon doesn't have the amount of gas that they've dedicated to this. This, this has all the, all the characteristics of what, you know, in the stock market, you call a pump and dump. You get, you get a, a corporation out there who pumps its stock or some analyst will pump its stock. Uh, by saying, "Ooh, look at what we found! Ooh, look at what we next have!" Great, the next great thing, right? Here's right. the next great thing. Here's this widget we've got, and, and it's gonna it's gonna take the market by storm. You remember when? Uh, what are those little What are those little handheld um, carts that you can ride around on your own? Um, you see them downtown in Anchorage. People on on tours. Um, anyway, I, I remember when those were announced. The segways, you mean? The segways. Stage. There we go. Yeah, yeah. When, when segways were first announced, it was going to be, you know, it was going to overtake the market. We didn't need cars anymore. We wouldn't need buses. We wouldn't need trains. Everybody probably wouldn't need planes. Everybody would be able to get around on their own, and it was, and it was just a great solution of all time. Um, stock, the stock jumped, um, and then the that's the pump part of it, and then the dump is. When you when the owners of the the current owners of the stock when they see it get to that peak they dump it <laughs> they've 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 maxed out their their what what they can get from the pump and then they dump it and you know the stock plummets and it it, it what the pantheon the pantheon the pantheon piece of this announcement reminds me a lot of a classic stock pump and dump uh, it's uh, hey look at this great announcement uh, that that we can put out on Twitter and all over all over the places and all these people who you know want to invest in Pantheon are just jumping at the bit oh we finally got a market for this non-existent gas and we'll go from here anyway that's what the news miner is is jumping at here and telling us that you know we've got the we've got the solution there's one the the, the piece of this that says 
an energy source, a, a piece of this opening paragraph, an energy source that could help lower costs for rail belt communities. Have, have they seen what the cost of the pipeline is? What the per unit cost of the of the of building a 40 inch pipeline to you know carry a trickle of gas is? I, it's yeah. just I again the economics of this is just I mean it's been it's been cited. I've wanted a gas line for years. I fought for it early on, but it became more and more apparent as we went on that the economics of it were just not going to work. You couldn't have a $30 billion pipeline and have the economics of it pay off at the other end in a short enough time period that you could get investors on board. That was always the problem. Yes, maybe in a 30, 40, 50 year turn cycle, you could get your money back, but nobody was willing to loan money on that basis. And by the way, doesn't this remind you of the whole Bill Walker? I went to Japan and I went to China and got mm -hmm. the contracts for the, for the gas to deliver the gas there. I mean, it's the same thing. So, so great. Great Bear said, we're going to promise you more gas than we have. That seems like a pretty safe bet for Great Bear because <laughs> they never have to deliver on it. This is a great PR move on our part. We know that they're never going to build a pipeline. Promise them as much gas as they want. Yeah. Well, actually, Walker's was more realistic. I mean, the Chinese actually need gas. The J Japanese actually need gas. I guess we I guess I guess in a sense, we need need gas and that we and that the coquillin is running short and Fairbanks doesn't have enough. But but the economics are the economics are just staggeringly against this. And then they then they talk about Susitna at the end, how Susitna, how, you know, we need Wally Hickel to push this through because we didn't have, we never pushed through Susitna, which would have been the great, well, Susitna didn't pencil out either. There's a reason that people don't build these things. And it's not because there's a great conspiracy out there to, to deny Alaska these projects. It's because they don't pencil out. It's because you can't find, can't find people to finance it. So I, you know, it, it's clear that the fair that the news miner doesn't have a business editor um, uh, who uh, who actually could you know put a market test to this thing, and it's just it's just another hallucination. And and Michael, there's a bad thing that comes of this. It raises people's expectations. It takes their eye off the ball of of what they ought to be focusing on, and it it's it, it it's another excuse for delay. Uh, of, of things that we ought to be doing now before they get more expensive to do later. And, and that's, that's, you know, headlines like this op-eds. I mean, this is the newspaper's op-eds. They're supposed to be thought leaders. They're supposed to think through these things. Headlines like this, op-eds like this, just, you know, it's like squirrel, right? Everybody runs off in that direction now. Oh my God, the news miner said that we ought to be doing this. All we need is Wally Hickel to push it through. Um, and it's just it's just a waste of time and, and an unnecessary, uh, it, it, worse than unnecessary, a a a counterproductive uh, diversion. Uh, and again, the irony that Wally Hickel did try to push a gas line and failed, and they said we need another one. Uh, okay, that, uh, it, is it expectation or is it deliberate distraction? That's the question uh, that's being asked. And that's a deeper one for sure. We have Nick Beggage on uh, yesterday, and every time we have him on, we always talk about how arithmetic and math doesn't lie, you know. And I think to that, we need to add the addendum of you know economics are a bitch because this is, I mean, you know. <laughs> This is the true. I mean, if it was great and it was pie in the sky, we could do whatever we want. Sure, it'd be great to build a gas line and export the 17 trillion cubic feet of gas we got on the North Slope to somewhere. That would be great. But somehow, some way, it's all got to be paid for. There's got to be an economical, you know, and it just it just has not worked. It's just there's not enough demand. Uh, for all that stuff to uh, come come about. And there was an article in the newspaper um, talking about um, the uh, the royalties, which we're going to get to, um, that, you know, kind of deals with some of the same things. Like, it, 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 you can't you can't just make this stuff up. You can't just say it's going to be there and focus on that to the exclusion of all else. And that's what I feel like we're doing here. We're just everything we can do to avoid the elephant in the room, which is it's going to be cheaper to import gas, period. And yeah, just, end of story. Yeah, it's sort of like it's sort of like state finances, right? Nobody wants to talk about nobody wants to be real about state finances. I, I've talked on the show before. I've written columns on we've got to be talking about revenues. We've got to talk about to save the PFD. We've got to be talking about more equitable revenues. 
Um, nobody wants to talk about that. So we talk about, you know, transgender sports and stuff. It's everybody wants a diversion from, from the hard stuff. Uh, the things that, you know, really take thought and really, you know, require pencil to paper and require real serious people to, to, to think about it. You want a diversion from that. And, and, and the diversions, you know, the versions are okay in the sense that they give your brain some relief from the constant gnawing of having to of having to worry about this stuff. But the diversions, when when you know when serious pe who people who are supposed to be serious, like the Daily News Miner editorial person <laughs> board, whatever uh, people who are supposed to be serious and give serious guidance to the community. Uh, when people like that go off on these frolicking detours and say, oh, all we need is a Wally Hickle to push it through. Um, you know, it's all sitting there. It's all, the gas is there. You could build a pipeline, you know, and, and Pantheon's entered into this contract. It's all right there. You know, serious people who, you know, then spread that, that diversion, uh, making it seem more, much more real than it is. I, it's, they're doing a disservice. I mean, this is... <laughs> Just to just to trigger a few people in the chat room, it's the same disservice is disservice that people do when they say, now you know after we've gone through the twenty teens and the early twenty twenties, now say, oh, I can solve the state's budget crisis by just cutting spending. No, you can't. We tried that, didn't work. Blew up in in Dunleavy space. He hasn't tried it again. Couldn't even get sixteen from the legislature to support it, uh, uh, to to back him up on it, um, and it's gotten worse from there. It's not happening. Uh, but, you know, people walk around saying, I can solve this by, you know, just cutting spending. Well, you can't. And you're diverting, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're taking people off on this frolicking detour, thinking they can do something that's not realistic. And, and, and taking us away from focusing on the serious matter at hand. It's okay to have, you know, sort of like the comic strip, right? Reading the comic strips is okay. We ought to be, we all need to be doing serious work in our life, but, but reading the comic strips is okay because it gives us a diversion, but nobody should believe the comic strips. And that's, that's what this op-ed in the, in the, in the Fairbanks new news minor is. It is a comic strip, you know, masquerading as serious thought. And, and to the extent people think it is serious and all we need is a Wally Hickel, you know, boxer. All we need is a Wally Hickel to, to solve this. It's just, you're just wasting our time. Right. Just need a fighter who'll get up there and do it, who will defy the economics of the situation and get it through <laughs> by force of will. We'll build the pipe and mine the ore to build the pipe and do it himself. I mean, that's kind of the epitome of the Alaskan, right? It rugged individualist, but there's a smacks right up in the face of reality when you realize that it's billions of dollars. All right. Welcome back. The weekly top three continues. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Uh, Brad has a lot of things that he wants to hear from uh, folks, but we're going to focus in on the congressional candidates. There are some things that he wants to hear, and there's reasons for that because math don't lie. Let me just put it that way. Math don't lie. And uh, we're rapidly coming up against the hard wall of we're, we're about to find out. This is going to be the ultimate FAFO. We're going to mess around and find out exactly what happens when you try and beat math and it doesn't work. Brad? Well, I know we don't, I don't, we don't talk about federal, like to talk about federal things on the, on the show, but this one has a relevance to me. This issue has a relevance to me because we're, we, because we have a, a, a contested congressional seat uh, this cycle and our Congress person will have some influence on the outcome of this uh, particular federal issue. And it is the budget. It is the, the direction that the federal budget is headed in. This past week, the Congressional Budget Office, which is the nonpartisan, I won't say bipartisan because it's not, it's nonpartisan, the nonpartisan uh, uh, arm of Congress that, study arm of Congress that looks at the budget and follows the numbers and publishes the numbers. A little bit like legislative, the Legislative Finance Division here at the state level, but not quite because Legislative Finance Division is really run by the Senate Finance Chair. Um, and in Congress, the CBO is really, uh, is really truly independent. It's not run by the, 
the chair of the finance committees or the ways and means committees. So it looked at the budget. It looks at the budget periodically. And this past week, it released its latest assessment. And it's a stunner. The congressional, this is from the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. And if anybody really wants to follow the numbers of what's going on with the budget, I suggest that you follow the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget because they they do really good work in analyzing and understanding the numbers of what's going on. This is from their summary. The Congressional Budget Office released its update to budget and economic outlook today, projecting uh, that the national debt will set a new record as a share of the economy by 2027, while interest payments on the debt will approach their record as a share of the economy this year and exceed it next year. By 2034, the debt will grow to 120% of GDP compared to 99% uh, at the end of fiscal year 24. So in the span of what they're what what CBO is projecting is in the span of 10 years from 2024 to 2034, the the debt, national debt as a share of the economy is going to draw going to jump 23 percent from 99 percent where it is now to 122 percent. CBO increased its projection of the budget deficit to 1.9 trillion, an annual number of 1.9 trillion in 2024 with interest payments of $892 billion this year and totaling interest payments totaling $13 trillion over the following decade. To put that in perspective, interest payments, the interest on the, on the debt, which is really the, the, the year to year, the big impact of the debt, how much you have to pay in interest to finance the debt, what, what national organizations refer to as dead money. Uh, because you're just you're paying off debt. You're not building anything. You're not doing anything with it. You're not providing any services. You're just paying off debt, and so it's viewed as dead money from that from that standpoint. The dead money is going to rise from uh, with interest payments this year of 892 billion this year. That is to put that in the perspective. That is bigger than the number we spend on defense. It's bigger than the number we spend on Medicare. The biggest, the biggest defense and the biggest non-defense programs we have out there. The estimate is that that interest on the debt will outstrip Social Security in the next Social Security payments in the next ten years, becoming the single largest segment of the uh, of the budget. Um, used to be, people said, "Oh, well, interest rates are so low. You know, it doesn't matter what the debt is. We could run debt 200, 250, 300 percent of GDP it really won't matter because interest rates are so low and interest costs will never will never amount to anything. Well, guess what? <laughs> interest costs, interest rates did catch up and, uh, and and interest costs are now swamping. And before anybody goes off and says, oh, Biden, uh, see, uh, Committee for Responsible Federal Budget did another analysis this week in uh, in anticipation of the run up to the to the debate this week between Trump and Biden. And again, you can find this, and these are just numbers. There's not, there's not, they're not trying to put a political spin on this. These are just numbers that the net, the net 10 year debt approved during Trump's term exceeds the net 10 year debt uh, that has uh, that extended, that has, uh, has been adopted during the Biden administration through largely through the tax cuts, largely by reducing revenues. Trump is is responsible for more of the debt, more of the increase in the debt that's going on now than Biden is. Biden's responsible. I mean, he's added to the debt also, but but Trump has added to it. Trump had, has added to it more. Um, so so with that background, what I did was spend some time going through the candidates' positions, uh, the congressional candidates' positions, because this is this is relevant to us in Alaska. What the hell are our congressional candidates? saying about this and going to do about this. And and this is, I've just gone to their websites. I haven't gone to every speech they've given, and I'm sure they've all touched on it at some point. But I've gone to their websites to look at their priorities. And it's stunning, the the lack of focus on this on this problem. This may be the most serious problem the nation faces. I know there are a lot of problems. I know there are a lot of issues. But in terms of economics, this may be the the, 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 the growing debt and the growing interest payments uh, may be the most serious problem uh, the nation faces. And it's just, you look, you go and look at their websites, it's not there. Nick Begich, 
Um, these are his priorities. American energy first, protecting Alaskan jobs, protecting our freedom, educating the future, protecting our children, making health care affordable, national security, protecting financial sovereignty, which is all about Bitcoin. Um, and that's it. There's nothing about getting the budget under control. There's nothing about balancing this budget. There's nothing about getting interest rates under control, uh, 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 the net interest costs at the at the federal budget level. Nothing. It's just those are the priorities. You go to uh, Nancy Dahlstrom. Uh, here's her priorities. Defend Alaska energy. End inflation. That has something to do with interest rates, but not really a whole lot. Defend Alaska energy, end inflation, and, low, and lower taxes. Lower taxes would put us into even more of a hole. Uh, protect our freedoms, support public safety and the rule of law, stand with our military, bolster national security. Debt, interest costs, size of the federal budget, nada. Not a, not a thing in there. And then you go to Mary Peltola, right? Fish, family, freedom. <laughs> those, are, those are her priorities. Uh, uh, solutions for Alaska Natives, child care and early education, empowering working Alaska families, food insecurity, infrastructure development, social security, choice, uh, uh, habitat resiliency, health care, LBGTQ and plus rights, schools and veterans. Those are her priorities. Budget, interest costs, balancing the budget, reducing spending, nada, nothing in there. So, Michael, I don't, I, you know, this is bad. This is really bad uh, that we don't have candidates who, who on their websites where they, right. you know, there's nothing, nobody getting in their way. They interface with the world, right? And, I mean, and, and I they will, get to set their priorities. I will say in fairness now, and I haven't spoken to Mary Peltola and I haven't spoken to Nancy Dahlstrom. I've reached out to both campaigns, haven't heard back. Um, but we have had Nick on several times, and Nick, in almost every instance, we talk about the national debt, the budget, the overspending, those kind of things. We do talk about that. But you're right; if you're good, those are things that should be. Because what's the number one thing when everybody does all these polls for people? Like, what's your top priority? The economy is always up there at the top. Almost always number one is the economy because that's what people feel every time they go to the grocery store is the economy. And the economy all ties back in large part to federal spending because that's what's driving the inflationary measures and all these other kind of things. So while he is talking about it on the trail, you're right. It should be right there front and center on the website. Math doesn't lie. You can't keep spending more than you take in and expect that it's all going to be okay. He talks about it on the show when you bring it up. But but here's, here's I guess, my point. The, the candidates are setting the priorities that their constituents are thinking about, right? I mean... Can, some some constituents are independent thinkers and go, oh, the budget. I mean, what's your position on the budget? But some, a lot, are just sort of laid back and saying, well, the candidates will tell me what's important, and then I'll decide based on what they say is important between them. This it's an educational opportunity that 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 election cycles give you to talk about issues that are important, not only to talk about what your position is on that issue. Uh, but also to talk about the issues that are important, that uh, what Alaskans ought to be thinking about, what Americans ought to be thinking about, and and for and 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 for the budget, and for spending levels, and for interest levels, not to not to you know break into the top, whatever the heck the number is on each of these websites, not to break into the top, and in uh, in in indeed it should be at the top, but not even to break into the into the into the ones you're talking about that you are self-selecting to talk about, you think are important enough to educate your constituents on. Not to break into the top is just, I mean, it's just just astounding to me. And and it's going to roll into the debate. I mean, the big, the big, the big issue at, in DC among among these organizations, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, the Concord Coalition, and others, is will we have a debt question <laughs> during the debate between Trump and Biden? And, and, you know, it's not certain we will, that there are other social issues and, and, and various other things that, that, uh, that, that the moderators may ask about instead of, instead of the national debt. And that, that's just doing a huge disservice. Uh, it, it's a waste. It's sort of like the, it's sort of like the Fairbanks news editorial page, right? It's a waste of space diverting 
diverting Alaskans from things that they really can do something about and really matter, you know, to run off this trail of all we need is Wally Hickel out there, you know, as you said, digging the dirt for the pipeline. Um, it's, it, 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 it's, it's disappointing that we're not seeing these candidates talk about it. I've heard Nick talk about it on the show. Um, and, and he has good thoughts about it, but, but I want a candidate. I'm looking for candidates who put that issue front and center, because that to me is the front and center issue that we ought to be talking about in this nation right now. Um, one minute here, but how, I guess to build, to play devil's advocate for a minute, most people don't want to get down into the nitty gritty. Most, you know, most, you know, we're kind of wonkish here, right? I mean, we're, we're into the national debt thing and talking about that. The average person, like you said, is just kind of laying back and they don't want to, they're thinking about their household budget. They don't want to think about the national budget. So from a perspective of saleability and palatability to the voter, do you think that that gets too far down into the weeds? I mean, is this the Ross Perot, let me do my whiteboard here and, and show you where the economy's going? Or what do you think? Quickly, it, it is the Ross Perot. I mean, Ross Perot. Ross Perot drove Bill Clinton and drove us to a balanced budget by by two thousand, which Bush then undid, Bush Cheney then undid. But Ross Perot drove the agenda, drove the Clinton agenda. I know that from being around the the people who were setting the Clinton agenda. I know that Ross Perot drove, you know, Jim James Carville to say it's the economy stupid. Ross Perot is the perfect candidate. Yes, Ross Perot didn't win, but Ross Perot did the did the nation a great service with all those whiteboards. And I think that's exactly the type of thing uh, that that I would like to see one of these candidates uh, uh, kick off on. We're just reading Gary's comment: the state reps need to keep the state population is saying is important. Sorry, Brad, 90 plus percent of Alaskans have not brought up the debt as they have issues right here, right now. The debt issue must be brought from the top with the Oval Office. If you want to see this first in line, then you need to run your platform. The average Alaskan is not passing that concern to the candidates. I, I mean, maybe, maybe that's what we're talking about. Maybe that's what I just was saying. I mean, is this too deep? Is this too wonkish for people? But I would also agree with Brad that the Ross Perot example shows that Americans do care about the economy if it's brought front and center. I mean, again, we know that in every poll, when they talk about major issues, immigration, defense, gun control, abortion, that the economy tops out in almost every one of those because it is the one thing that affects every voter directly. Maybe a voter is not affected by abortion or gun control or this or that, but the economy affects every one of them when they go to the grocery store. And so maybe it is a conversation that needs to be started by the candidates. Gary, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I, think, I think the candidates have a responsibility. I, I mean, this, this is just me. But I think the candidates have a responsibility to use their platform to educate Alaskans. Now, I understand that, that you poll Alaskans, what do you want to hear about? You know, what, what, are the, what are the current burning issues to you? And I'll talk about those. Um, but I think, I think the candidates also have a responsibility to lead on issues and say, look, you may not be worried about this. You may not be worried about the national debt, but let me tell you, just like what Ross Perot did, let me tell you why you should be concerned, greatly concerned about the national debt. And 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 I think candidates have a responsibility to do some of that. Now, they also have a responsibility to hit the issues that that you know that their constituents want to talk about. But I think they have a responsibility also to educate their 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 constituents on well, the issues that are important lead, out there. Yeah, they're leaders, right? I mean, that's what we say. They're elected leaders. We need them to drive the conversation in that part as well. Yes, they need to listen to the constituency, but it is important. I mean, and if I was listening and I was part of uh, like Nick Begage's team, I would go rewrite that page. And at the top, I would put the it's the economy, stupid, in quotes, James Carville, Clinton, you know, blah, 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 to show that. I mean, that's really what it is. And then talk about it because it is important. I mean, we again, we were just we had Nick on yesterday and we were talking about, you know, world reserve currency status and some of these other things. That's all directly tied to the economics of it. This thing, if it gets out of control, you got to realize if it is out of control, that, if we hit that wall, uh, you think if, if you think inflation's bad now, 
what do you think happens if we lose the world reserve currency status? What happens if we continue to borrow more than we can spend or, or spend more than we can borrow? What happens if we, you know, get to that point to where, I mean, right now the payback and, and the numbers from the C, uh, the CBO um, are, I mean, we saw the estimates last year, the interest payments were over 900 million, a billion, $900 billion last year. The estimates were 1.2. So the CBO, which is considerable, continues to be very optimistic and very rosy at times. The numbers that we saw from last year said the estimate was going to be over 1.1, almost $1.2 billion in payments. They're saying, oh, 900 million, 900 billion. Again, we're talking about this huge, it's going to be the number one thing we're paying for with dead money that does nothing. Part of what drives the CBO numbers is they assume, they have to assume by law, they have to assume the law as it is. And the law has the Trump tax cuts expiring uh, next year, I think, or or maybe the year after that. And so they assume the trucks, the Trump tax cuts come off that that the tax rates return to what they were the tax code returns to what it was because those were passed those, those were temporary tax changes the tax rates return to what they were and so the revenues uh, start going up again um and so you can you can get higher number i mean but but those numbers are scary enough number one the number one thing the nation's going to be spending money on is dead money <laughs> is going to be spending on dead things um it, you can get concerned enough about that. But if you really want to get, I mean, they do another analysis. I think it's called the alternate analysis, which is the current policy analysis. And um, and and that that says, okay, well, maybe not all the tax cuts are going to expire. The Congress will extend some of those tax cuts. Then it gets even worse than that. And that'll that'll get you the numbers that uh, that you're that you were just that you were just talking about. But regardless, I mean that's sort of that's sort of a minor detail when you're talking about debt costs, interest costs at that level, interest costs that exceed the cost of defense, what we're spending on national defense, exceed the cost of the biggest, uh, other than social security, the biggest non-defense program, uh, Medicare. Right. A trillion a year, a trillion a year in debt service. What does that do for us in the long run? Well, newsflash, it ain't good. That's what happens uh, for when it's a trillion dollars a year. Number three of the weekly top three. It's another nail in the coffin for the Cook Inlet. And by the way, where is the RCA? Brad, I read this and I just, my eyes were rolling so far back in the back of my head. They almost got stuck there as I read some of these uh, articles in this piece. Go ahead. Well, the um, uh, the state put out some, broadly, put out the Cook Inlet, state waters in the Cook Inlet for lease. Uh, had a lease sale for Cook Inlet, uh, it, not only Cook Inlet waters, but but onshore Cook Inlet also, just the Cook Inlet region generally. The state put out a, a lease sale, oil and gas lease sale. Um, and the state did, as they have the authority to do, the, as the executive branch has the authority to do, to do under statute, the state uh, offered lease terms for new leases uh, that had no minimum royalty in them all they all you had all the leaseholder had was the obligation to pay a portion of its net profits uh, uh, in in the event it finds anything uh, and uh, and develops it and and is able to run with it all it owes the state is net profits uh, and the state went out with lease terms like that and that's that's very that's 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 similar to what some of the legislative proposals have been to eliminate royalty or reduce royalty down. And the state went out and, uh, and, and ran with those terms and it got three bids all from Hillcorp and all basically uh, on the margins of already existing fields. Nothing, nothing out there in terms of major exploration plays or major exploration efforts or new thoughts or new areas that uh, the producers wanted to explore, um, even at even at these even at these reduced terms, um, it got three bids all from Hillcorp, uh, and it was a failure. I mean, the the lease sale was a failure in terms of the, in terms of what you what you would have expected listening to the legislative hearings and listening to all of the, all of the discussion about if you just if you just eliminate royalties, we'll have we'll have this boom in in gas failure. Now, John Boyle, the commissioner of natural resources, makes a good point in that he said, you can't judge 
you can't judge the success or failure of, of what might happen if you reduced royalties on existing leases by what happens in a new lease sale. And, and, and what, and the point Boyle was trying to make is look, a lot of the Cook Inlet, a lot of the Cook Inlet region is already leased up. And, and part of the concern is people aren't developing what they know to be there because of high costs. And if we reduced it, but they're already under existing leases. And if we reduce the royalty on those leases, then, uh, then we might get additional, uh, an incentive for additional investment in those leases. But here's the, here's the, here's the thing that I just, I just chuckle every time I see Boyle say that, or anybody from the administration say that, or any legislator say that the administration already has the authority to reduce royalties on existing leases. There's already a statute that provides the administration can do that. They don't want to do it. They, they because the, the producer has to demonstrate that the reduction in royalty is necessary to incentivize the additional investment and has to commit to make the additional investment. And and the and DNR is concerned that producers either A can't demonstrate that that's really the problem, that, that the royalty is really the problem, or that that the producers will be willing to make the investments necessary to, to develop it if, if DNR reduces the royalty. So what DNR wants to happen and what the producers want to happen is the legislature just to do it unilaterally, just drop the royalties unilaterally, and maybe some producers will make additional investments um, as, as a result of that. It's just... I mean, for Boyle to say that, oh, you can't, you can't use this to, to judge what would happen if we drop the royalty on existing leases, is technically correct. But John, you've got the solution in your own pocket. <laughs> just, just say that you will consider, well, and you have said that you consider these applications. But producers aren't making the applications because they don't want to make the commitments. They just want to talk about it a lot, sort of use it as an excuse for not developing not developing additional additional uh, supplies. In any event, the, the lease sale was a failure. It demonstrated that dropping, dropping the royalties on new leases, eliminating the royalty entirely, turning it into a net profits, eliminating the royalty entirely isn't, isn't going to result in this boom and additional development out there that everybody thinks it thinks it's doing. Uh, and, and so that has, by experience, that's sort of moving off the table one by one. We're, we're crossing out all of these alternatives that people have claimed uh, will 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 lead to additional supplies out of the out of the Cook Inlet, and and proving that that's really not what's going on. That that the economics in the Cook Inlet have changed so much that people just aren't going to develop additional gas supplies. That's what's really going on, and that and that we're moving inexorably to to LNG imports. That's where the state is moving to. But, but we're taking so damn long to go through this process that we're moving the, st the, the point at which we can have these LNG supplies in way past the point where we're going to need those supplies. Right, right. And putting ourselves at risk of having this gap period that we're the only way to, 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 to fill the gap is going to be with very expensive LNG supplies coming in through, you know, small cylinders and the cost of those are it's huge. And so, and so we're extending this gap period while we're, while we're, you know, people are talking about and running around in circles about these, about these other alternatives. That's a problem. And that, that gap period and delaying the decision on going ahead and, and setting up for LNG imports, that is the cause, that's going to be the cause of, of higher prices uh, in the cook, you know, for, for South central consumers, if that's, if that's where we end up and the agency responsible, we'll get back to the RCA, the agency, <laughs> the agency responsible for overseeing this and making sure that doesn't happen with the responsibility of ensuring that the lowest reasonable, that consumers only pay the lowest reasonable costs, the regulatory commission of Alaska, they haven't held a hearing on this. They haven't. They haven't challenged the producers, at least on the record, or not the producers. They haven't challenged the utilities to say, "What are you doing about this?" Uh, they haven't. They haven't. You know, has, asked the utilities to come in and even update on the record, even update the report 
that the utilities did last year that said, hey, we got a problem here and LNG is the solution to it. They haven't done anything. In fact, the RCA who holds at least one public hearing a month, maybe two, where they do these broad scale discussions, the next public hearing is set for later this month, well, this week, June 26th. And tomorrow. the only t- tomorrow, thank you. Tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> and the only thing that's on the agenda, other than some administrative stuff, is a presentation on China and the risk to corporate America, current Chinese laws, and critical infrastructure update, including cybersecurity and risk mitigation best practices from a, a person from the FBI. Well, I I agree that China's a problem. I agree that the risk of cybersecurity is a problem. And I agree that we ought to be that we ought to be talking about that. And I agree the RCA ought to be talking about that. But you can have more than one thing on an agenda. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and 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 talking about the Cook Inlet and what the utilities are doing to bring additional supplies to meet their service obligations at the lowest reasonable cost, talking about what utilities are doing would seem to be at least equal to China, if not a little bit ahead uh, of, of China. But is the RCA talking about that? No. I mean, it's, it's Michael, we're going to run into a problem. We're, we're putting ourselves in a situation by delaying action. We're putting ourselves in a situation where we're creating this gap period where we're going to have, where we're going to have a huge problem. And, and we know what the solution is. We know where we're going to be at the end of that gap period, but we're, we're wasting time. Sort of like the Fairbanks, if there's a theme here, it's we're wasting time. Uh, we're wasting time, you know, doing other things uh, before we get there. Yeah, no, I mean, I can see that for sure. Now, there is a public participation component of that meeting. Maybe, Brad, you need to get up early tomorrow at 9 a.m. and go make a two-minute or three-minute presentation on this. To, uh, to But, I mean, they should be they should be hip deep in this right now. This is enough of a crisis. They should be hip deep in this. This should be the number one topic for Alaska specifically on this. But it's you know it's just not it's not going to work out. Didn't you did you speak to the RCA or did you 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 got in front of you spoke to the RCA about this already, right? I did a public participation a couple of months ago, I think, um, and talked about it and uh, and. And, and hoped that would trigger some additional, I mean, what the RCA has done is they've, they've hauled in the utilities and they've said, okay, what's your plan if you run short of gas? What, what does your tariff currently provide if you run short of gas? Um, and had the, and had the, the utilities come in and talk about that. And that's not a bad thing to talk about. I mean, yeah. What, what, if, what happens if we do run short of gas? What happens if this coming winter or the winter after that, we have a gas shortage. The storage, the wells in in NSTAR storage field go down, and and we have a gas shortage. What's your plan for that? Good thing, good thing to talk about. But you know, avoiding the shortage, <laughs> avoiding that condition w- would seem to be at least as high a priority <laughs> as as what are you going to do if it happens? And and I'm really, I, I truly am concerned that we're just by running through all of these hoops. These, these these hoops that end up in dead ends. Oh, we're going to have gas down from, from the gas pipeline, from the North Slope. We're going to have, you know, additional cook inlet development. We're going to drop the royalty. We're going to, you know, we're going to reduce the royalty on new leases. We're going to drop the, by running through all of these hoops, all of which are failing, by running through all of these hoops before we get to the solution, we're just extending this gap period farther and farther out. And it will be expensive. I mean, People talk about LNG being expensive. It will be expensive to bring it up by cylinder, which is sort of the only way, the only option we're going to have um, cylinders on barges. It's going to be the only option we have uh, if we don't have an LNG regasification facility um, installed by the time by the time this happens. So there there is a there is a true cost that's being created here by by extending the gap period, and and the utilities are responsible for it for not for not you know pressing forward getting on the dime and saying, we got to make this decision. Here's the decision and here's the support for it. Here's the, the phase two report that we've been hiding all this time. And the, but the RCA is complicit in this by not jumping up a dad on the utilities and saying, what are you doing about it? So when the time comes, when the gap comes, and when we're bringing it up by cylinder and energy costs in South Central skyrocket, it's because it's not because Cook Inlet ran short of gas. It's not because 
you know, the gas pipeline didn't get down here. It's because of the delays that were created by running in these circles that we're doing right now. Right. It's a lot. Again, it's a lot of this wishful thinking. And again, this kind of emotional response of it's got to be Alaska gas. We've got to find a solution with Alaska gas. We can't look at anything else. And um, again, I'm kind of a prepare for the worst and hope for the best kind of guy, you know, and if you haven't prepared for the worst and at least have all your ducks in a row and things prepared by the time the crisis gets here, you're so far behind the power curve. It's going to cost a lot of money to make all that work. Because now, because now it'll be a crisis, and now you'll be in a crunch time. And instead of planning it out and having it done ahead of time and having it cost a reasonable amount of money, now whatever they do will be under the it'll be it'll be millions of dollars more, and we'll all be paying for it. Yeah, and it's and it's it, it, as I say, it's in part the utilities fault because they're the ones that have the certificate the obligation to serve they're the ones that have the obligation to ensure that they have adequate supply at a reasonable cost and and their failure to even release the phase two report i mean come on you've got the report the report tells us something release it so we all can know what it says so alaskans can know what we're facing um but their failure their failure to plan is a, is a huge problem but we've got a backup to that the RCA, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, we've got a backup regulator that's supposed to make sure that that the utilities live up to their obligation to serve. And their failure, uh, frankly, when the history is written on this, at least when I write the history, their <laughs> failures it is going to be is going to be play as big a role in this as the failure of the utilities to, uh, yeah. to do it in the first instance. Well, I mean, again, you, you, where is the phase two report? Right. I mean, that's the biggest thing. I mean, you, you said it, you hide, you hyped this report that was coming out and everything and it was going to give us more information and then radio silence for months. And that just leads me to believe that this report says something that you don't want out in the public, which is essentially, I think I'd lay good money on the fact that it says it's going to be cheaper to import gas than anything else at this point, because the economics just don't work out. There's not the economy of scale needed. That's just, I mean, it's just, I can write the report right now. I can tell you what it's going to be. Uh, if we ever see it, I bet that's what it says. Um, all right. Um, the, t- the the amount of times where we have these self-inflicted wounds, where we know we can see the end coming, we know the bridge is out, we know we could stop the train, and we just don't do it, is, I just can't fathom it. Just can't fathom it. And, and, and it's the responsibility of thought leaders, like the Fairbanks News Miner editorial page, like right. the candidates for Congress, like the RCA. It's, yep. the, it's, it's the responsibility of thought leaders to get out in front of that train and say, look, the bridge is out. We need to, we need to slow the train down. We need to divert the train to another track. We need to do something. It's the responsibility of those thought leaders. I mean, yeah. We, we put them in that position by saying they're leaders. We put them in that position by electing them. We put them in the position by, you know, the reading the news minor. And it's their failure, the failure of the thought leaders to get out in front and say the bridge is out. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, Alaskans, uh, Alaskans don't have it as one of their top 10 because their thought leaders haven't done the responsible thing and say, look, yeah. this ought to be in your top 10. And, right. and that's, you know, so I, I blame, I blame, <laughs> I blame them as yeah, much as, exactly. as much as, as much as anybody else. Uh, quickly, Brad, what are you looking at next week? I think next week is going to be the permanent fund and returns on the permanent fund. There was a hearing yesterday before LBNA that I thought uh, was interesting that I, that I'm going to dig into and, and talk about a little bit. Uh, there's going to, should be some updated performance numbers coming out of the permanent fund corporation in the meantime. So next week's going to be right. about the permanent fund. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Good to talk with you. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.